So it's. Uh, So I'm going to slowly start. So who is here a Java developer? Tell me, tell me. Oh, all, oh, I see some people are not. Okay, and who has used annotations? Like, okay, so who is a Spring developer? Right, you, oh, not that many. Java E? Oh, yeah, so. So the, the thing is, yeah, I am also the Java E and Spring developer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, really, I am. <laughs> Okay, the guys knows a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, like about me, uh, this is so. I live under this mountain over the lake, among the dwarfs. There is even a dragon there, up, but I'm a developer, wizard, and an architect. Uh, for if you don't know who is an architect, it's just the opposite to architect. <laughs> architect is a guy that brings order to the project. Yeah, and you have two strong architects or to, to many architects, you have so much order that it's hard to do anything, really. It's everything so regulated, it is like you're screwed up. You can't do anything more. So then you need an architect, the guy that brings kiosk to the project. It also means then creativity. So okay, that's a, most, most of you don't know, don't need it, but if you are working in a Switzerland for banking or in Germany, probably you need also an architect because you have so many regulations at this point that without that kind of guide, you just, guy, you can't do anything. So okay, I am Java developer for like uh, 17 <laughs> years. No, I'm really a demon. Don't tell me I'm not, okay. Uh, and I am like, uh, involved with all this JE, Spring, OSGI, oh, that's my Pokemon, I call them. I'm also a Scala developer at night, mostly Scala, JS, C, C++. I work for this small, okay, company, engineers we do, yeah, consulting for banks and insurance and, and whatever. Okay, that's not going to be a talk about this. Uh, so this is going to be about the, how I, how I started. So who knows what this is? Who has seen this picture before? Yeah. Uh, so that's how I started the programming, and I loved it. So it was Commodore 64, and my first language was a BASIC. And the thing about BASIC, who, who, who has seen BASIC and knew, knows BASIC a little bit? Okay, so the BASIC is a, okay, this is a BASIC language. It's very, it was very, very popular at 80s, and even at the beginning of 90s. Why? Because in the moment you wanted to do to write something with basic, it was like you don't need any ceremony. You just write and it works. It's just you don't have to declare variable, variables. You don't have to even. It's better. You don't have to invent the names of the function because you just have line numbers. So you spare, spare a lot of time of inventing names, function names. You just have line numbers, and that's it. So the, you may be laughing from basic, but it was if you wanted to write a very small project, very, something like. 20 lines. The basic, even now, is very efficient to that. It's scripting efficient. It's very similar to what we use JavaScript at the moment. You don't have to worry, and you just you just write, and it works. The problem is, what if it doesn't work? Okay, but just a moment. Uh, so, I ran this project. I wanted, in fact, to write a procedure that writes uh, greetings DevOx Morocco a few times. Uh, this. This machine is very slow as a basic. Okay, and I seen the bug because something was repeated. I wanted hello DevOps Morocco three times, but I have hello hello. And the, the problem with, with basic is like you everything you have is get global. It makes basic very uh, very efficient at the beginning because you have everything global. You don't worry about context, local variables. Everything is global. But then it's very inefficient at the end because if you have a bug, you have basically to scan all the project, all, all the lines. If you have hundreds lines, hundred lines, that's not a big issue. You can just go, uh, ah, here it is. Problem is, well, what if you have thousand lines of code? And you, you can't, so the bigger the pro project in basic is, the more you have to scan, so the, each file subsequent bug costs you more. So there is a, simply a trade-off. Very fast at the beginning, very efficient for a small project, very tough for the bigger. That's the way I, I skipped basic at one moment, a couple of weeks after programming it, I understood I need something better like Pascal, 
right? Okay, there were a couple of strange projects, uh, programming languages on Commodore 64. And then I went through C, where I had to at least declare variables and, um, and procedures, functions. And I ended with Java, where I had classes. So more and more ceremony. I was slower at the beginning, but then I was very efficient in bug fixing for a large projects. Why? Because if bugs happening inside of the class, more or less I know the bug is here in this class. I don't have to really scan all my code base. It's mostly here because maybe I'm putting the uh, two integers to the function. I'm getting something not as uh, as I want, so the bug is there. It's very located. So that was the that's the idea. Why do we bring this ceremony to other languages? So right now, but a couple of years ago, more than ten, I realized that slowly we are doing the same with Java. We are making basic with Java. Why? I will, sh I will show you something that happened to me on the production. So I have Java. I worked in the Sprint project. And I, I simplified something. It's very, how to call it, it's completely um, artificial example. But more or less, it resembles the things I think I was working on. So uh, let's imagine I have REST controller, so I have web server to do something. And uh, in that case, particular case, I want to have a greetings uh, service. So, OK, I will write something like Spring application. So I'm going, oh, moment. I'll make it visible for you. So it's so uh, Spring application, Famic controller, class. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting Spring Boot. Now, I, uh, how I do it? I call HTTP client uh, and get to localhost 8080. Hello, who? DevOps, of course, Morocco. And then I'll execute it, and then I will have a response, da 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 da, like this moment. I'll make it above system outprint the response. Uh, I hope you see it, and then exit. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to call this server, and then I will print the response. And this is a Spring application, so under request, make it hello. So like here, I am. At the moment, I'm only printing hi. So I expect that if I call it, sorry, it's uh, Maven behind, so it takes time. This 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 shiny machine, this machine is shining blue. It's compiling, doing something, blah 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 blah. And uh, finally, I should get something like hi. Yeah, response is hi. Okay, so it worked. It's very simple Spring application request param. So maybe I would like to complicate it a little bit. So I have some class called who. What is a who? It's a bin that has time and name. Okay? And maybe I will have some service for greetings. So not, not, I will want, won't put everything in a, in a controller. I will put something in greetings. So, you know, I will make it faster, so I will present you. So uh, service greeting is I have method greeting who, name, and time. So I should get uh, who was uh, greeted and what, at what time. And now I will just uh, put this code here. So who set name, name, who set time, blah, blah, blah. OK, I will do one more thing, but uh, for a moment I will remove it and then return, maybe uh, give greeting. So I'm ca I've called this service, OK? So mm, just a moment like that. And maybe uh, here. OK, so like that. Uh, just. Okay, it's like. Uh, okay, so uh, I will do that, but one more thing. I, sh I am expecting that uh, there will be greeting sent to, with this uh, uh, greeting service. So I should see like greeting at a time because here I'm calling this service. Once, once more. But I do one small thing more because I do also. Uh, I do also some funny logging because business wanted me at one moment that I put something in, in log. Uh, what I was doing. So there is logger log, log, log here. So I'm going to use it here. Uh, auto wired. Uh, log, logger log. Okay, so only this. So you see to this log there is uh, no parameters. Simply in the log I should see greetings done. Okay, somewhere in the logs. That is ex exactly the story more or less I had on the production. So I started the code. And by the way, it's very bad style of writing, but the thing is, let's analyze what I've got here. Greeting surprise. 
moment. So I was calling it with who devox. Then parameter who set name should be devox. It was this hue. And then if I go to service, I should have moment. I will just greetings who. So I, I should expect, in fact, not surprise name there, but the devox. Why was it there surprise? Now comes the basic. So the basic means you have very simple language, but in order to find out where is the bug, you have to scan whole the code base. And I found the bug in a logger. Why was that? Because in a logger, I have auto-wired hooks. So even though this method message, what this method log wasn't using the who bin, it had access to it. So like it was like global variable. It was even worse than global variable. It was it was local to uh, it was global for a thread. So such things happen. You maybe not notice that, but the who bin was request request scope. If you have request scope bins in Spring, then you typically have that kind of errors because everybody can inject it. So basically, request scope is a nightmare. And you have it. It's, that's my point. Uh, suddenly after, OK, no, it wasn't sudden. It, was, it happened through years. The Java and the frameworks become more and more complicated. And finally, I realized this language is not as, I would say, strict as before. Because right now, I can inject anything to everywhere. everywhere and if I'm having bug, I am just like in basic. I have to scan the code base because maybe the wrong bin is injected. Maybe the aspect works that I don't even know the aspect is there because my colleague just written it two weeks ago and went to vacation and that didn't tell, tell us that there is an aspect. So I called method plus two plus two and it gives me a seven because the result is manipulated in an aspect. How cool. Okay, so that's it. And so, but we all use this spring, all that stuff. Maybe we, we think it's needed. So let's just quick, quickly go through all the problems that happen. And I identified in different problems. So why do you use Spring? Who, who is using Spring? Why do we, would you use Spring? Tell me, one reason. Tell me. I, I need to evangelize as a red hat or Spring stuff, as crazy as it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> Same with Java E, I guess. Same so so what, what is the reason? Makes it right sim simple to write technical stuff. So, what's, what, what, which exact stuff is simpler? One? Like, uh, start with a transaction. Transaction, okay. You? Uh, uh, it's easy to make a, a MVC, like a, a okay. controller. Controller MVC, okay. So, maybe just uh, rest endpoints and things like that, okay? Yeah, and control. What? No, no ceremony. No, no ceremony. Okay, no Empire ceremony. Things together. So dependency injection, you mean? Exactly. Because I wanted to attack dependency injection, container-based. So uh, I will explain you. Okay, so uh, a lot of people I know use Spring, especially for dependency, so solving dependency injection. And then I see strange problems because people use it, but sometimes they have funny bugs there. So. You, as you use it, you should know where is the bug. I have, for instance, class user activity logger, and there is something injected like user repository, okay? And it's injected here to this private variable, and then someone uses this class user activity logger, user, new user activity logger, my user, then calls a method store activity, and bam, gets null pointer exception. Why? Who knows why? So it's like you, you define the class, you have some injection, could be auto-wired, could be whatever. But, and then you, you call this class, uh, call code, it compiles, and then you get null pointer exception. Why? Because the bin isn't injected. So the, the point is that you have created a class, you instantiated it with a new, but it can be instantiated with a new because it's a, it's a, it's, it needs to be known by by container, so with that it wasn't like blessed by container, so it's not known, so the injection didn't take place, so it doesn't work. So the thing I've seen that young developers right now learn is all your classes have to be bins, and new is kind of for, forbidden. You don't use new in Java. Your instantiated object is harmful. That's not what I say. 
that it's what I observe uh, how junior developers see the world right now. Okay, so that's second part. Maybe the same story. Like uh, we have some user activity logger, and with user activity loggers, kind of that maybe we sh don't want to put it in the main thread. So if we are processing a request, maybe you would like to postpone it to them some, some second thread. Like, because all the logging is not business critical, let it be performed in some queue somewhere. So we use executor service. It's in Java. And we can say, my executor service, by the way, in one moment, just do this. User activity, store activity. But user activity is a bin with some scope, injections. What happens if you call it like that? And this scheduler works in a different thread in Spring environment. What will happen with transactions, security, whatever? Everything crashes. So the second thing, it's in fact written in Java e spec in Spring. You just don't mess with threads because everything collapses. Threads are dangerous. So that's the second lesson. Of course, threads and are dangerous, but the second lesson. Uh, young developers take from all these frameworks, no threats, we don't use threats at all, okay, because those are harm harmful. Okay, cool. So, the fa other thing, I just don't have time to go through all the problems, life cycle of objects. So, basically, thing I have learned when I started with object-oriented programming, if you construct an object, the purpose of constructor is create the object for you. That's the object-oriented principle that is usable. After you construct, you can use it. Uh, two screens before, we've seen an object that was constructed, it wasn't usable, because not, uh, not everything was injected. So in Java E, you have this funny annotation, post-construct, pre-invoke, so it means you have objects, you have references to the objects, but you can't use them before something happens. So like, constructor doesn't construct anymore. We are used to that right now. For me, it's from object-oriented principles, it's kind of strange, okay. So the other thing is like, I'm a lot of time attending, uh, I'm a consultant, so uh, mostly I don't in do projects on my own. I enter the projects when uh, they have problems. So, the, so I look how the code looks like, and th there's a funny thing I try at the moment in every new project. Is I, like for the, I look for the bin that has like 18 or 16 auto wires. So you, and, or injects. So, and you know, I find those classes. So the guy says, oh, it's cool, new project, greenfield, everything, clean code, and then class 18 auto wires. Because it's so easy to inject stuff that people don't see the moment it's like kind of broken. What kind of class is the one with 18 injections dependencies? Is it clean at all? Could it be clean? Oh, for sure not. It's like single responsibility principle, at least it's broken. So, but it's so easy to create that, uh, that you don't see the problem. So the, the other stuff is like, where you spot the problems? You spot the problems on production because your code compiles, your tests are working. I will address this stuff later. And the problem happens on production because the wrong bin was injected. The transaction hasn't started because it was called inside of the unknown thread or whatever. So you have compiler, but you can't trust it. The, what, what I particularly like, it, it happens as, whenever I call, see the Java code, what is there mostly? Getters and setters. And if I'm looking for the logic, what kind of logic I find there? Mapper, that maps from cell getters to other setters. That's the whole business logic we do in a lot of Java projects. It's really hard to find out. I was in insurances. I had a really complicated business rules. It was hard to find them out in, in the code base because it was hard to spot them between, between mappers. So the moment you have something like dozer or bin mapper, I know something went wrong. Okay. A broken encapsulation is uh, particularly other stuff. So it's like, uh, like this stuff, I like this code I presented you. So you have a method, you call it method with a parameters, but inside it uses something <laughs> that is kind of private, that it shouldn't use, but you can't control that. Your encapsulation is broken because yeah, everything, for instance, can be request code and reused. So of course, if you read that many books, I read a lot of books about Java E and Spring, you learn that for every of this problem, there is an annotation that helps you. Helps you to do with schedulers, helps you to do with some kind of transaction. There are a lot of them. So that's a, another language that is now embedded in Java, language of, of annotations. If you have like two years, you can master this language and you will be efficient. Like. But the problem is not really Java anymore. 
In my opinion, that's ugly XML. I was really like writing the system with first even EJBoss 1.0. It was at the moment before it was called JBoss. And I had all these XMLs. Right now I see them in Java. They are only called annotations, but they are not really much better. They are better, but not that, that much. And this is just different language. So there's a solution for that. Is there anything? So one, one very important lesson from today, of course, this lesson number one, no, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know why isn't this popular and widely accepted by every developer is there is this blog post from Oliver Gierke. Who has seen it before? Okay, I am. Yeah, you guy. So <laughs> the master. So, so basically, you should never ever use field injection because it's broken. It's really, it's like uh, Oliver Gierke, it's one of the um, contributors of Spring, says it's like begging for null pointer exception, of course. So if you want container-based dependency injection, you should always use it with a constructor-based dependency injection, like that, only. This means, for instance, that one of the problems we, you will avoid, if you construct this object, you can't construct this object without giving this dependency. You are, will be forced by the compiler, so compiler will prove it for you. So one, this one step is better. So, and, and in this blog post, Oliver says that, of course, it means constructor-based dependency injection means better testability. Exactly, because you, in the test, you can provide the dependencies. It's visible. You don't have to play with mocks, uh, power mocks, whatever. Uh, and if you, for instance, are writing the six, sixth dependency, you will have this constructor with six parameters. And in this moment, you will know, okay, probably something went wrong. And you will be forced, maybe, by your colleagues or whoever, or architect, to solve this problem now before it, it, it is too big to be solved. Like, because if you have six dependencies or five, it's still possible to rewrite the code, to like, split the class in two. If you have 18, it's too late, mostly. OK, so you see it. And it's better encapsulation. Of course, constructor reconstructs. There is a, this is the famous blog post I just want you to know it. Once you work with Spring, never ever use uh, field-based dependency injection. Injection, but my my opinion is, dependency injection is great, but you don't you can do one step better. It's like in the previous one, but just forget about this inject. For, uh, forget about container. What is wrong with this? This is a plain Java. It works always. Doesn't need any container. Doesn't need need any class path scanning uh, aspects. Whatever. It still works, and it's proven by compiler. What could be better than that? OK, I will show you. So works with a new. And uh, by the way, there is a, I love this page. This is a Polish version of Stack Overflow. And we argue a lot on some solutions. So I had there like bigger blog posts when I was like comparing the whole solution based on Spring and the whole solution based on plain Java. Uh, I will show you a couple of, uh, how to, a couple of um, code uh, snippets from this uh, bigger argument. In fact, uh, later I created the, the whole uh, proof of concept for them to just uh, isolate the problem. So one problem that was posted here, OK, Yarek, you say you can live without container dependencies, uh, the container-based dependency injection. So what do you, do you do if you have this magic service bin? It has all like six injections, and it has this method performs complex calculation. You see, it's like kind of translates input to output uh, according to some rules. How would you even work with that without container-based dependency injection? Would you really write six times new creating it with a constructor? So uh, I don't have time to explain you all the steps, but basically if you always, if you look at that project, that kind of a problem, the thing is that it's not how you would write this mess uh, without dependency injection uh, on container, the, the thing is how it happened that you have this mess. Could you rewrite it a little bit different that you don't have that many dependencies? So for me, if, if you have the, that kind of dependencies, you look at the, the business logic there, obviously you see that, oh, no, 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 it can't be uh, compliant to a single responsibility principle at least, because you, you have too many reasons to change this code, like even, even here, because a lot of things can happen. So. For instance, in this case, I uh, reduced the problem to having, having like two dependencies. Okay, maybe the three ones. So 
that's the that's the point, and mostly it's what I see in a real project is you just have if you if you are thinking what would you do if you have ten dependencies, the thing is how to avoid having ten dependencies. So there is the blog post, in fact in GitHub I did about it, but no worry about it. I will show you a couple of patterns that I'm using. So who has used Scala maybe here in this room? Did you use some dependency injection framework in Scala? No. Why? Oh I just did some, uh, some small coding. Okay, so I, I did bigger projects. Yeah, so that's the thing. You, that's the thing that not every, but most of the Scala developers, they use Scala, they build a bigger stuff with Scala. And they never get idea that they need dependency injection. Why? Because one of the reasons is the language is uh, more sophisticated, so one of the, the, for instance, patterns they use is something called cake pattern in Scala. Basically, it means that with a Scala, you have some basic dependency injection built in into language. It's called cake pattern. The funny thing is, and the, the biggest advantage of that, it's proven by compiler. So if you have like wrong bin, it won't be, it won't happen that you have a wrong injection or you have null pointer exception. It will, you will have compiler error. Okay, mostly there is one exception to that. But mostly you have compile time error, which is way better than like seeing your problems on production or even in tests, because you don't have to write tests for that, for something that is proven by compiler. So the funny thing is that cake pattern particularly you can do with Java also. It doesn't look that nice in Java. It needs something like, you know, default mm, interface implementation, but what's the thing at the end? And I just, I don't explain this code because I don't have that much time, but remember cake pattern in Java, at, at the end, for instance, you have like Mongo application, you start your application, which is a user service component, and that's my dependency, Mongo repository, because I am starting with a real database. Okay, if Mongo is real, and that's it. If I'm doing it for tests, maybe I'm replacing the Mongo repository with local user repository component. That's how it works. The, this, this part looks more or less like in Scala. This is a little bit of boilerplate you have to write only in Java, but it still the, has a great advantage. It's proven by compiler. So if it, if it fails, it fails on compile time. The second thing that is, okay, I'm not that really proud of that, but sometimes you just have so many services that depend on each other that you just don't want to solve one problem, which is the first, which is the second. So one of the funny solutions I've seen, uh, this is lazy. Who knows where, where this thing is, where you find, it? what is the lazy? Okay. What? <laughs> no, no, it's like, uh, that's, what, that's the second lesson for you. Who has heard about Waver, Waver or Java Slang project? So for my, like say, recommendation for you, whenever you deal with some containers in a business project, you don't fight for cycles. You don't fight for really micro performance. You fight for, you, you just want to write business logic. Forget about Java util and that stuff. It's really not that efficient. Way better project is something that was previously called Java Slang. Now it's, now it's called the, the thing, Waver. And it's just immutable collections. They are slower than the Java ones, but they are way, way safer. And I think they have better, a better API. So Lazy is one of the containers and it means, okay, I'm not sure if the service one depends on our service two, whatever, I can define them in any order, but at the moment I will try to use one of those, like service, service two, they will be like solved lazily on the part in the correct order. Okay, that's a, um, I would say, more complicated stuff, I would say a little bit artificial problem, but it, you have it. Uh, but the lesson for you, use waiver, really. See this library, it's beautiful. The API is beautiful. And uh, so, but in fact, what I'm mostly doing, you will see it in my code, I don't care about patterns. I don't care about you, you know, using something because I don't really, I, my problem is never, I, I need a dependency injection, what I replace it with. My problem is I need to write the business code. And I'm going this way, basically, mostly I'm ending with something like that. I have like user service, this is typical case, that's my user service that needs Two dependencies, user repository, session repository, okay? So, and that's my code. 
So anytime I would like to use user service, I put here new and new. So sometimes the problem is, okay, I have to, like, a uh, lot of new encode, a lot of uh, new expressions. No, I don't, because typically I, I extract it to factory. You all, all know the pattern that's called factory, or a builder. That's, okay, factory is a builder is also a factory. So, and then I have the user's module, but also has these dependencies, but also has a default constructor, okay, default with some clock, maybe because it was the, this is from the, let's say, really cold as a proof. And then I put those news here, and then I isolate the problem. So I can, for instance, create user module for the real project, giving only this dependency, when, which internally will be converted to other dependencies, or I can create for test purposes this one. So it's naturally, if I go, if I not go the way I need the beans, I need dependency injection, I simply avoid the problem because I'm creating the, let's say, object-oriented approach for, to that. Okay, but that's only one part of the story. So my message for you, don't think about, I need dependency injection. Think about, I need the business to be done. And then you will, maybe you will end without having any container at the end of the day. Uh, but there is a huge but there, of course. What if you have servlets and JAX servlets? The problems, so I say basically that if you have servlets or whatever that is servlet based, you are, okay, I won't use this word, but you have a problem. Why you have a problem? Because servlet is like, there is a class somewhere, it's instantiated by some container, and you can't pass parameters to that in runtime because it's instantiated by container. So in that moment, you have a problem. And what is the solution for that problem? So, there are a couple of solutions, but the one that I uh, propose it, maybe you should not use servlets. So, have you ever, any one of you, written web server in Java without servlets behind, without Tomcat, WebSphere, JBoss, whatever, just with any, any else technology? I use Netty. Netty, okay. It's, so, you are my guy. So, Net, uh, so Ratpack is a web, uh, so it's a web server library written on top of Netty. So it's like a little bit simpler, than, okay, way simpler than Netty. But Netty is behind. So how you write the code for Ratpack? It's really cool. So I, I'll write it like that. So you, for instance, every great story in Java starts with public static void main. Really, guys, you should know that. If you don't start with public static void main, you are already doing something stupid. So. I really say it to that. So, so maybe I'm going to write it like that. Create server, start, but then I will define a static method, create server, throws exception. Okay, sorry for this throws exception. That's the one issue I have here. It's, I will, uh, it's not talk about Ratpack, but it's, this is the issue with Ratpack. So Ratpack server, that's an object, create server, and then, then I start it. How, how I define it? Functional with lambdas, okay, moment. I will make it like this, sorry, yeah. Da -da -da, server config builder, so there is, I can, with lambdas, define that this server, for instance, uses one thread. This, it's not talk about Ratpack, but you know what? To write very performance servers, you have to use one thread. That's a other story, it's about writing non-blocking servers. I had this talk on Tuesday. Uh, I don't have time to explain it right now today, but it's also a very interesting thing. So if you've ever heard about Node.js servers, which are very, very performant, they, they use the same approach. So it's like in NetBase, async IO, we do as much thing as we could on one thread. By the way, of course, you can use like four threads or more. But if you with Ratpack use hundreds of threads, probably you are doing something wrong. And you are even going against your performance. So for instance, what I say here, functionally, I start with main. There is no class for saying, no annotation. I say, my server, whenever someone goes on traffic FIBO with some parameter n later, will call a FIBO handler method, okay? So other handlers could be here, and then I say, this handler is, for instance, Fibonacci implementation, uh, like here, and, and then, sorry. And then final from context. Okay, I don't have much time to explain the code for you, but the great stuff is I don't have any class path scanning here. I'm just doing my stuff, so I'm like implementing Fibonacci, you know, this recursive version of Fibonacci. I will just write it here very quickly, blah, 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 blah. You'll have it, and you're done. Okay, so that's how you can write servers in Java right now, without any servlets, without this just plain functional way. 
and it has a lot of advantages. One of the advantages is how you do testing of that. So how you do, do you test controllers in Spring? Maybe. Do you test even controllers in Spring? It takes, in order to test them well, you have like to start Spring context, then the controllers start. It takes like, I don't know, 10 seconds, and you have it. And then you maybe you call with a HTTP client if this Fibonacci gets the result you want. But with a red pack, you do basically the same. You start the server, you call the server on HTTP, so it's the black box testing. And the thing is that this red pack server starts like 15 milliseconds. So really, so if you have hundreds of tests, hundreds of black box tests, because you want to test HTTP with security, cookies, all that stuff, you can like, in two seconds you, have, you can have them. It's cool. So it's a big advantage. And at the end of the day, it's not only that fast in a development, it's also uh, very, the code is way cleaner because it doesn't rely on magic at all. No class path scanning, no things like that. But what if you have containers? So that, that's mostly my case. I work in banking, so I have like architects that say, tell me, okay, Yarek, you, whatever you do, you must work on WebSphere. Of course, WebSphere. So that's the thing uh, we, in fact, used in one of the companies I worked, and it was very cool. It's like, whenever you are in doubt what to do, build a wall. That's a solution that is worldwide known. So what's a wall in case of containers? Maybe I'll show you the whole code. So, uh, the done. A wall means let's pretend we have let's we have some business method like calculating something. So we rewrite the clean code for that clean plain Java version. That's my service. No beans, absolutely no beans. This will never be a bean in Java E or Spring whatever. It's a clean Java code that I can test and I test this with unit test whatever. Then I have a little bit broken code that is also a Java. But what is broken here? Maybe I'm using Entity Manager or the database or stuff like that. The runtime bad things that are not clean anymore. But it still doesn't define any transactions, doesn't have any annotations. That's my second level. Let's go a little bit dirty. At, and the, at the end, if I have a Java E server or Spring, I have to put it as a stateless bin or a controller, whatever. Then I put all these things on and this one lighting. That's all my, I call it dirty code that is polluted by containers. Nothing more. So this I can test, this below I can test. And it was really, it's, this thing is really working well because with that, that approach, the testing is very trivial. I can really trust the tests because no container context is there. So nobody maybe mocks some, something stupid about transaction. It will work uh, as expected. So there's a nice talk from Uncle Bob. Uh, called Who Has Seen Clean Architecture from Uncle Bob. It's a really great talk because he says one thing. Whenever you start a project, don't think about, am I going to use Spring or Java E or which database? Think about your business logic and write it here and then slowly pollute it with some kind of plugins. Like you, there are different ways to do that, but I don't have time. But really concentrate on clean core, okay? Uh, and uh, maybe my approach, I recommend to you, that's, that's my goal. Whenever I'm writing a business logic, I might, I'm thinking about architecture, I want to have easy tests. Really, how to optimize, what is a, a clean code? Okay, there are different definitions for me. The tests are meaningful, meaningful and simple. So if I, for instance, in tests with Archelian or Spring, whatever, have to really start the huge machine that is complicated, no, that's not a good solution for me. For me, a good solution if, if the tests are fast and they are simple to understand. Okay, so does it mean that every injection in JB auto wired is broken, basically? No, it's not. For instance, there are a couple of scenarios. Like if you have, I have this kind of project. I have a project that is customized for customer. So every instance has different plugins. And I can't really start them in, uh, in compiler time because I don't know, it will be started with this database, with this security rules somewhere. For that kind of stuff, those things are needed. But if you, that's mostly the case. If you have one project that has one productive instance for one customer, one set of rules, you know everything at compile time. Why, why to rely on this magic? It's not needed. So uh, that's, that's my message. For, for think about making it simpler. So uh, by the way, Sorry for that. So it's a really funny story, okay? 
I, I found a book that describes this particular, how to call it, the things that young boys do mostly. And it, this is a hundred years old book, and the, it shows even the pictures of the boys doing that stuff. They look very bad, and I call them mockists. So, <laughs> mockists are <laughs> mockists are guys. You, you, you know who is mockist? The guy that uses mocks a lot in tests, right? <laughs> All the time, mock, 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 mock everything. Mock, 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 mock. So, okay, there is even. I've seen this code, for instance, this is, this, this is the real code that was uh, somewhere po posted and somebody needs uh, the help with tests. So, when flashcard service find, find all, then return get flashcard. So, we've mocked the service, then we use this method, and then we assert. So, what is really this test testing? I mock the response, and I test if the mock was okay. So, what I tested is, in fact, the mock. You know what, it can't be funny, but I had this pro, I, I was really working for a company that has like thousands of such tests. It was really for us funny because we were deleting implementations and the tests were green. <laughs> Could it be better? <laughs> Managers are satisfied, coverage is best as you can imagine. Tests are always green. So this is even called London School of TDD. <laughs> so the problem is that yeah, you test, there is a Mokito library that allows you, and I say, so, like, I would say, half of the Java developers in, in big companies, what are they doing? They are writing huge test suite for Mokito. Okay. <laughs> the other problem is that, finally, whenever you want to refactor this code, you have to refactor all the tests. So, if you think what are the tests, the, the thing that should guard your code for, against refactoring, but what if you have to with refactoring also rewrite the tests. Does it guard anything? Does it, is it useful at all? Yeah, so it's, that's the problem. So I think I recommend you be careful with mocking. In fact, recently I even uh, joined a project where they forbidden mocking. At the beginning it used uh, forbidden mocking with this, all those fancy libraries like Mokito, EasyMock, whatever. And at the beginning it used kind of stupid, but later I realized, okay, and now they are very, very careful about mocking, and they select what to mock, and the, the tests they have are really meaningful. They test real the business, the business logic. Okay, uh, I skip this couple of slides because I don't want to really uh, extend my time. So, uh, but the biggest problem, you know, maybe at this point with your Spring, Pro, Spring user, okay, dependency injection, okay, that's a easy thing. What about aspects? Like, maybe you have security, maybe you have transactions. So how can you even do that without having this container that starts here transaction, the container that protects your code, checks this, the principle of security? How can you even do that? Or how can you work without being able to write your own aspects like this? I, I really love this. How do you write aspects? Like you, you have really object-oriented programming, so you invent some types, and then finally you work on objects. That's can it be better? Okay, so it's like I really writing your own aspects is also always a funny story, but nevertheless, can you really live without that? So, so anybody of you tried doing transaction without this? No. Is it possible? Really? Yes. More than that? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> For sure not. <laughs> okay. So basically those are types of aspects you typically wear. Cache, security, transaction, validation. And what is the solution for? Okay. So, moment. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so even, even the best one. I, I, I've seen this in the example of uh, Spring, I think. Yes, post filter has permissions. So if I, whenever I'm looking at that code, I'm really thinking, is it Java? Because it's like, that, that's a Java. That is some kind of string that is interpreted. Does it even make a sense? Is it declarative programming? People say it's declarative. So in my opinion, it's just pathetic because it's like something I called stringly typed. So it means that my my most important parts are in strings, so nobody proves that. If I make a spelling mistake here, it will. That, what, where is this uh, really visible? Yeah, the string and string is on one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is stringly type. Yeah. So, uh, so the thing is that it will be proven mostly okay in tests or in production. So, can you live without that? So that's my solution. I, in fact, I did it 
a couple of years ago accidentally. So whenever I want to call, like, this is my code. Order entity, new order, so I create new entity with JPA on my back. Then uh, I save this entity. And I'm done. And what I do, that's, that's my code. Instead of writing this transactional blah blah this, I put this do takes. What is this do takes? That's a method I have somewhere, one for whole the system. And this method, what it does? It starts for me a session, begins transaction, and then calls my lambda there, where I have all my code. So lambda expressions spare you all this misery of having the containers manage transaction. You can do it here. What's the advantage? This is proven by compiler. This, you can test it without having the spring context started, whatever. So I have, in a couple of companies, I have tested that test, for instance, transaction isolation problems. Without having container in the middle, just writing such tests, it's so easier to, to check for that stuff, okay? So if you think, okay, but who has written this code? You, Yarek, okay? Maybe uh, not everybody is that smart to, to really roll back a transaction or whatever. No, you don't have to write it. There is a great JOQ library from Lucas Eder, and it's not only the one that it, he has written that. Transaction, exactly the same. What do you do in transaction? That's the code. Normally you would put here transactional, but, but other, the other solution, you put it in the lambda and you call, it, pass it as a parameter to this method. You're done. It's the same amount of code. And the better, it, it's, where it's proven by compiler. It's compiled. So the same with security. You have one method, do secure. By the way, it was in Java uh, standard so many years ago. Okay, similar method. Uh, and exactly, you put maybe request, you write which permissions, and then in the lambda you pass what you are going to do. You are done. No annotation needed. Same amount of code. Okay, so does it mean all annotations are bad? No. There are a really couple of really great annotations, like annotation override functional interface. Sorry for a uh, moment, moment, moment. I'll go back. Uh, good annotations. Sorry, that's immutable, no label, not null. Who, who thinks not null is a good annotation? Yeah, it's good. It's great? Yeah. I think it's awful. Why? It's what? It's optional. No, no. Basically, I, I think it's year 2017. Uh, soon it will be like 2018. And you should never ever use null in Java. Unless you work with old code. Unless you have to cope with old code. So it means that... If you are going to use not null, you would put not null everywhere. What's the point of putting not null everywhere? So my opinion is like, never ever put not null, just assume not null is everywhere. And only in those uh, stupid cases where you have to use null, put maybe no label or things like that. Okay, so that's, that's the point. So, or test of dynamic tests, those, those are good annotations. So I think all the annotations that help the compiler or your tools are cool. Because those are exactly the proven at compile times, they, they, they help you to build cleaner, more proven software, yeah, more secure. Uh, those are other annotations, JSON serialized, XML. So whenever you go from Java world to another world, there is a, at the moment there is no better way of writing this as just use annotations. So Java non-Java collaboration. Uh, and I think it's not a perfect solution. For instance, in Scala they do it better, but uh, in Java, it's the best at the moment, I would say. So this is that. And by the way, it's again, uh, so let's think. Whenever you work with Java database, so it, oh, that's also a kind of serialization, how you map Java objects to, to tables. Yes, there is a JPA. But whenever I look at the code of JPA, so at, at the projects that use JPA, I, yeah, they resemble me this, uh, for instance, medieval tri tracks, like uh, that is uh, Magna Carta. John, by the grace of God, King of, of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy, blah, 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 whatever you say. It's a long story, long story, long story. Where's the point? And then first that we have granted, blah, 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 by the God. And then finally, really, really late, you, you really find the meat, the, the thing that was described in the tract. So that's the, the yellow. You really, it's really hard to find it, to spot it in the original text. 
So I found this the same happens in Java code whenever you work with JK. That's an example from a project. Sorry, it's blurred because I don't want to really the, the dispose the, the, the show dispose by the code of a customer. But here is the Java code, and here is the preamble. All this by the great blah blah god, etc. This is, which is stupid stuff, but you work like that with uh, JPA, so maybe to make it more visible, it typically looks like that. Name query, name query, name query, a finally public class country, and no, nothing there really interesting. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, so it's like, I call it it's still stringly typed, so a lot of very important business things are in strings, and uh, that's it. So. Uh, I hate JPA particularly for being too complicated. I do recommend you try maybe alternatives. In a real project, I found out they are very they are very primitive, but they if you work with JQ or my bait my bait is at the beginning you are a little bit slower because you don't have this magic that help you. But then you never have this problem like with JPA. Finally, at one Friday, you can't go home because you put nulls into the database and then you have to scan all your code. Why is that? With JOQ, you go small steps, but always forward. No magic. Okay, so I'm going to end this talk. Uh, maybe some useful resources. Oliver Gierke, field-based annotations. Mario Fusco, he really great, uh, creates a great talk. Gang of four patterns, so the patterns we know from object-oriented programming, how to rewrite them with lambdas. It's so cool, because now we rely on, oh, sorry, on, that's my demon that switched the, <laughs> uh, Uncle Blob dependency injection inversion. So he particularly described this case. He likes dependency injection, but dependency injection doesn't mean container in between. Annotation mania, that's the page that really is making fun of all these annotations. Uh, technology radars, maybe you've heard that application servers are really obsolete right now. There is no point of really even using this Tomcat or whatever, uh, not mentioning the web sphere. That's the old story, not anymore, not needed anymore. Pong, uh, by the way, you need a positive example. I created as a proof of concept for you, Rat Pong. It's a Rat Pong implementation of Pong game, this old Atari Pong. For me, the proof of concept, if, if, you, if you have some framework, check if you can write Pong with that. Why? Because Pong was written in 1973. If you can't, if your framework doesn't, is not good enough to write Pong, it means it's not ready for 2017 because it's not even ready for 1973. Okay. And by the way, Spring 5, I'm really, really attacking Spring, but Spring 5 has this part, web flux, which works the same way as a rat pack is working. So you don't use annotation. Yeah, this is a Spring without Spring. You can create Spring controllers without Spring beans, without annotation at all. It works. It's beautiful, really. So you, you, they, they have really great documentation. And so about annotations, one, they were great and saved uh, us a lot of problems writing huge XMLs, but they they basically rely on magic <laughs> reflection, which is dangerous. And in the year 2017, we have lambdas, which make a lot of these decorator templates useless. And basically, whenever you can use compiler power, Java compiler is great, so give it a chance. Use the type system. And the reflection or magic is the last thing, whenever you, when you can't prove something with compiler with test, then is the moment for reflection. But it's not that often as you use it right now, mostly in typical mainstream. So <laughs> let's make Java great again. That's my story. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so there, is there, are there any questions or I am always OK? Yes, of course, I have GitHub, so I can, there is a one, uh, one thing I can recommend, if you, if you write Java fun again,